Hey, Alec, nice to see you. You're in London, are you? Yeah, I'm. Uh, well, I'm in Bedford, actually, um, oh, in which Bedford. is near London, about 30 okay. miles away. And I Close like your, your, your office looks really sophisticated. What's going on back there? You're sort of planning to take over the world or contact tracing or something? <laughs> uh, this isn't actually my office. <laughs> uh, I'm currently operating out of my sister, out of my uh, my daughter's bedroom. Oh, I see. Uh, all right. So she, well, she's she's <laughs> plotting something on the back there. It looks like there's all these uh, markers on the wall and maps and things. <laughs> looks like fun. All right. Well, we're gonna we're going to uh, jump into um, a few, uh, hopefully, a few gems. We'll see what we have time for. So, um, what I've got here is the first thing I wanted to do is try to do like a little issue jam with you. You're unfamiliar with all this. So that's kind of nice because it means that we kind of go into things cold. And uh, what I thought I'd do is sort of give you an idea of, of I, I'm developing story materials, but I'm doing it in a very kind of specific way. And I usually do it in a way where I come up with some issue or some uh, conflict of some kind, some intellectual concept that I could then look for narratives to, to, to tell a story around. And so uh, one of the progressions that I, I, I work through is I start off with some issues and then resolutions, and then I kind of come to a moral argument. So to give you an idea of what that might look like, in an issue, I'm just aiming for a sort of what if question of some kind that um, could could ultimately become like a dramatic dramatic question in, in terms of narrative. But in the beginning, it tends to be something a little uh, more innocuous, like um, let's say, what if everyone was equal? So you know, you pose a question like that, and it gets you thinking about what does it mean to be equal and who is everyone? What are, we you know, what are we talking about here? And so that leads to various discussions. And then I use that to come up with a resolution. And if I was coming up with a resolution that followed from this uh, issue, it might look something like this. Special people deserve special treatment. And so the idea of a resolution is that it would be something very emphatic and provocative, a statement that uh, you know, would divide people. So they would uh, sort of say, I agree with that or I don't agree with that. And then you could sort of debate that in the narrative. And then I try to take all of that later on towards what I would call a moral argument. And moral arguments have a, a certain pattern to them. But in this case, it's a bit hard to read probably. But it, it says the more entitled you are, the more privilege you have. But without humanity, you have nothing at all. So... This is what might happen as you work your way through uh, these different steps. And that's sort of what I'm aiming for. But sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't, and that's fine. And all of the, mm -hmm. all of the things that happen in a jam you know, get saved for posterity, and sometimes they come back to haunt us again, such as these issues and things. So that's a very brief overview. But what I want to do with you now is just try to see if we can come up with some issue, a kind of what-if question. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to throw out a few topics to discuss, and we're just going to spend a few, you know, sort of five or 10 minutes discussing them. And then I'm going to throw out some premises, which you'll see what those are in a minute. And we're going to try to connect the dots, as it were, with them, because sometimes they don't seem like they're related, but as you talk about them, your brain, you know, tries to find relationships, and that's sort of fun. So I'm going to give us, I don't know, let's say 15 minutes. It's not much time, but it gives us a focus uh, so that we have a sense of where we're headed. So I'm going to randomly sort of, I know what these are. Oops, that one's obvious. That one's showing up. But I'm going to go up and take one off the top. And so this one is uh, a front stabber. <laughs> uh, we've probably heard of a backstabber. Uh, this, this is a phrase that um, it seems a bit silly, perhaps. This, uh, but it's something that, um, uh, uh, well, I don't want to call him a politician exactly. But a politician over here in the U.S. used this phrase at one point and said, you know, I'm not a backstabber, I'm a front stabber. You know, you see me coming kind of thing. And uh, I don't know, I was trying to think of, you know, this sounds amusing, but I guess there are people that pride themselves with, uh, you know, being really upfront and not uh, playing games behind your back. I don't know, I was trying to think if I ever knew a front stabber. I, there, there was someone I worked with who... Um, you know, came at you both from behind and from the front. I don't know what you would call that, a 360 <laughs> stabber or something. <laughs> they, 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 they didn't wait for any uh, opportunity. They made their opportunities to, uh, to entrap you. Um, have you ever had anybody difficult to work with? Oh, 
yes <laughs> many times but sometimes, sometimes uh, that 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 approach where you can in fact in, in situations like this quite often you know, when somebody somebody comes to you with an idea that ability to turn around and go that won't work because of this or that won't work because of that or or that's a really bad idea for this it can it can be productive you know sometimes mm. people need to be stabbed in the front um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so it's yeah it kind of depends on the connotations of it really doesn't it on what context it's meant because you could say that, that that's actually a positive thing to actually attack somebody well, I suppose it depends on which way you look at it, but uh, to attack somebody from from a, a, a straight up, not talking about them behind their back, giving them the opportunity to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, so, it, yeah. It's not... Yeah. So we will quite often find that there are... In, 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 in my line of work now... Um, when somebody comes to you with a with a with an idea or a problem and you kind of go well actually what you're doing there is completely wrong and you have to gently break it to them somehow you have to stab them gently and i don't know <laughs> what a gentle front might be called <laughs> well i'm just thinking a, a kinder maybe a kinder word and because you work in the creative industries is creative friction mm -hmm. you know somebody who creates you know causes creative friction but it leads to new opportunities which is sort of what that word's supposed to be but i can't write so this creative friction leads to new opportunities because the person is a front stabber they tell you right away mm, that's not going to work here's why and so that's refreshing you're saying having having a, a you know i guess the opposite is somebody who keeps it all to themselves um you know who simmers uh uh mm. you know and yeah. and and yeah. and sort of seethes so yeah and they're upset and then stabs you in the yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Simmer yeah. and seethes, but um, they stab. They're their backstabber. Yeah. Okay. So you, for, so front stabbers could be kind of good. All right. I'm gonna pull up another, well, another if, one. If it's got surgical precision. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Surgical. Actually, I'm gonna write that down. So surgical <laughs> precision. Um, stabber. Oops. I can't. I can't. I can't write. So let's call it the let's call it the scalpel. The scalpel <laughs> stabber. Okay, they sort of they kind of cut it with surgical precision. Um, yep, I've covered my creative friction. Here's another one that uh, I thought was kind of amusing. It's a complexifier. Um, this was a, 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 t a term coined by Jeff Bezos of Amazon, and um, uh, he said that uh, owning the Washington Post could be a complexifier for him. I guess this is something that's supposed to make your life more complex. Um, mm. uh, now it was kind of made into a joke because he was uh, too timing at the at the time, and so somebody suggested that it's a euphemism for penis because that can complexify your life when you get involved with someone you shouldn't. Um, but I'm just wondering, you know, complexifiers. Say that again. So it could be a small complexifier. It could be a big one. You know. Yes, exactly. <laughs> the size of the complexifier matters. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that this is this to me is amusing because, you know, it's the type of thing that maybe an engineer or someone who's very pedantic and detailed focused would say because life is really complex and relationships are messy and all this kind of stuff. But to say something is a complexifier, I can almost imagine someone saying, you know, children are a complexifier. Or something like that, which would suggest, um, you know, maybe there's uh, they're not so happy about uh, that uh, situation or something. Um, marriage is a complexifier. Uh, I, so I, I I think the way you frame it, if you use that term, is kind of amusing. I'm trying to think of complexifiers in my own life. Has this uh, COVID nineteen lockdown been a complexifier for you? I suppose. It depends on what you want to pick it as. I mean, yeah, I suppose COVID-19, I mean, yes, it has. I mean, it's created problems, but it's not the one that's created the most problems. Um, I actually, interesting, when you mentioned it, I thought of it in the same context as Front Stabber, as a person who, who made things more complicated, rather than as a, as a general, I don't know what that would be. Is it an adjective uh, or is it a noun? Um, as a general noun. Uh, because um, there are people can add a lot of, complexities to things unnecessarily so um or they can similarly 
as you said, life is complicated. So when um, uh, sometimes things can't be explained in simple terms, as we've learned with various political issues over the last few years, without going into details, people like to things to be simple. They like nice little packages that they can understand things in. And sometimes you can't deal with things like that. So you need a complexifier. It can actually help to challenge you and to grow as a person. You know. Um, in fact, most of the time when we look at the challenges that we do, I mean, from your own life, you must know, you know, you're constantly having to kind of do something that's far above what some other people would be happy to even attempt to do. Um, and you you take those challenges on and you, in, you, you come out of it and you kind of go, either I completely messed that up, but I've learned something, or I made a success of it, you know, what a result. Um, but that's a choice to actually take on those complexities and cho choice to make your life difficult for yourself in order to grow and become better. So mm. sometimes a complexifier can really be a, a, a as an odd term, but it could be something that's very, very positive. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. I like the idea that it's a person because my mind immediately went to the negative of a complexifier as somebody who just makes everything complicated. You know, nothing is simple with them. And and we certainly know people <laughs> like that. Um, you know, certain directors in the past who are in, in, in major complexifiers. Um, but uh, but I like how you turned you made it gave it a positive spin as you know something that could lead to sort of evolution you know and learning and all that that was um, yeah I, I like that I'm going to put learning on there yeah well as we face this this thing at the moment um, it's fascinating to see the 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 complexities in the communication so trying to bring something down to a, trying to bring complex issues down to simple communications uh, is really difficult. Uh, and it's a it's a massive skill. I don't, I don't want to sort of get into politics or anything, but but that ability to communicate the problems that we're dealing with now, the the the, the around COVID nineteen about the fact that we're trying to remain safe whilst also trying to keep the engine running enough because sooner or later we have to keep feeding people and we have to do all of those things. So you know we can't all just sit at home forever. Mm -hmm. um, so these are complex issues and. There's people who want a simple answer to them, and there isn't one. So there needs to be a person who is a complexifier who mm. can explain that, <laughs> uh, or someone who sits in between that. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what a what a translator for a complexifier might be if a complexifier was a person. Um, well, I'm just thinking we can we can know, have the 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 chief complexifier. I like that. That could be your role, you know, <laughs> the CC, the you know, in an organization, the chief <laughs> complex or oh, CCO, the, the chief CEO. complexifier <laughs> operate operate. Uh, 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 um, uh, you know what I'm saying. I can't even say the word now. The chief complexifier, complexifying officer. There we go. Um, I also thought. I also thought of um, you know, the the kiss. Keep fair, it that... simple, stupid. Uh, to be fair, if it was easy to say chief complexifier officer, it wouldn't be appropriate, would it? It has to be difficult to say. <laughs> exactly. Um... Exactly. All right. I'm going to throw out another one there. Um. Oh yeah. This is this is probably. Apropos, given what we said, executive time, I, I find this amusing how, you know, this was something that uh, uh, what has become here in the U.S. It we we think of it. I don't know what the U.K. response is, but in the U.S. we we laugh when we see it because this is what the president has like four or five hours a day of executive time, which everyone knows means that walk, watching Fox TV, cable TV, and and twittering and all, tweeting and all this kind of stuff. So. That's uh, a euphemism. So if an executive basically, you know, nods off and does nothing, has me time, that's called executive time. And I love that euphemism because we all have so much executive time on our hands now that we should be extremely productive. <laughs> I've, I've, I've never actually heard that. Well, I don't remember ever hearing that term before, but now you've explained it to me. There, there's there's a, the sort of, a, 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 I think it's in... in God, one of the Transformers movies or something. Yeah, I watched some some strange films. Um, I think one of the Transformers movies, they, the, the boy keeps going off into his bedroom and they say it's his special time or something because they think mm. he's doing something else in there. Yes. Um, so that's what conjured up to me. And also, you know, the sort of personal services mm. type. Um, uh, what was her name? Somebody paying. Uh, there was a, a, a woman who ran a an executive cool girl service. I see. Uh, was it Victoria? Was that I can't remember her name now, but yeah, there's been yeah, a few a of these on both sides of the Atlantic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah this is a UK one I'm thinking of. Mm. Um, 
So yeah, sort of got me. Anything that you put executive in front of tends to make me. That probably says more about me than it says about anything else, actually. Well, no, I I was thinking of the the Cockney investment banker, and uh, you know, executive yeah. time sounds like <laughs> sounds like something that you're doing, you know, um, in that regard. So that's yeah. very funny. All right, so we've got um, we've got these sort of these sort of topics, and it was it was pretty good. We we took about uh, twelve minutes there. What I'm going to do is maybe give us another ten. And I'm going to throw out a few premises, as I'm calling them. Um, these are premises are uh, adages, aphorisms, sayings. It you know, uh, and and they're the reason I use them is they're considered to be received wisdom from the past, right? And I I use them to shape narrative down the line. But I think it's always interesting from a story perspective to look at them in terms of some of the topics we've chosen. So I'm going to pick the first one at random. Let's see. Let's take this one here. Okay. This one says, it is easier to love humanity than to love your neighbor. And what I want to do is... So I was just really liking the back of those cards, the, the playing cards. That oh, yes. Cards thank you. Yeah. Love. yeah. <laughs> so... In terms of these topics we've discussed, does it seem to go with any one of them? I mean, with Front Stabber, I think that's actually quite funny. It does seem to to connect in some way. Easier to love humanity than love your neighbor. I think in terms of what is the meaning of this, I guess it, it's really just that in aggregate, we can look at all humanity and have cozy feelings. But when we have to actually deal with somebody who literally lives next door to us or works with us or something, it's much, much harder to deal with a person it's it's easier to deal with a person in the abstract than a person, you know, up close. Uh, and so I guess yeah, front stabber. Hmm. Um, yeah, or the complexifier because that adds to the problem that why you can't, why you can't yeah. love your neighbor That's because right. that complexifies yeah. things. You actually, yeah, you can love the concept of humanity quite easily, but when you actually have to deal with the complex issues of the you know drilling the hole, drilling holes in the wall at eight a.m. and uh, <laughs> Why does it always happen? I have a I have a guy upstairs who um he started I think doing um jump rope in his apartment and he lives above <laughs> me and of course that shakes everything and the first time he did it I thought oh my god here we go he's he's discovered jump roping and that's just going to be great and then it only went on for about 20 seconds. I realized, oh, thank God he's out of shape, you know. So he doesn't do it very often. And when he does it, it's only for 15 or 20 seconds. So I, I think to myself, well, I'm going to count my blessings because if he was a boxer or someone really fit, you know, I'd be in trouble because I'd be hearing that pounding all day. But thankfully, he's, <laughs> um, he's not in very good shape. Um, okay, I'm going to bring up another one here. This is an escape from reality leads to a day of reckoning. Hmm. Oh, that's, that sits naturally next to executive time. Um, <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, hopefully it does. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, because, well, I mean, we, we all kind of, our own nation notions of what our realities are so all seem very different anyway. You know, what, 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 what one person perceives as, as how they live their life um can be very different to somebody else you know what, what's important to one person isn't important to somebody else that 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 um somebody was complaining uh, again i don't want to sort of distract too lot too much from this but somebody um local i'm in one of those little local facebook groups you know that where people talk about various things that affect the local community and someone was complaining about the fact that the bin men don't put the bin back in front of their driveway they put it they put it in the middle of the driveway and they do that to me as well and they've written to the council about this and they've done all of it, you know, and they've complained about it on a number of times and the council sent somebody out and they did all these things. And I thought, yeah, they do that to me. And I live on the bend of a busy road. So it's quite a problem. And I have to stop the car, get out and move my bin. It takes about 30 seconds to do that. <laughs> and I have to do that about 10 to 15 times a year. So probably <laughs> it's about seven minutes or something of my life of a year doing that. It would take me longer than that to write an email. So it's actually just to complain about it. So it's not really a good use of my time to moan or complain about it. It's better just to get it done. Uh, and that's kind of where, you know, but, the, the, but their reality is this is a very big, important issue. So they're going to spend a lot of time 
they have too much time on their hands yeah <laughs> yes yeah, yeah so their reality is very different to mine mine yeah they don't they've got the time to do that and it's worth it to them to save that seven and a half minutes um whereas to me it's just nah it's just not worth it so i'm gonna so, think um, of who whose reality matters is my question because um yeah. i also yes. I, yeah, it, yeah um and and not having a shared reality is is interesting because i think that if we're you know if we're being kind we realize that yes we have lots of different of uh, differences of opinion we may even have different perceptions but it is important for us to try to have a shared reality of some kind and and when we don't when we kind of question the very underpinnings of a shared reality then we all get into trouble because we're get really far from any sort of sense of society so I'm going to suggest that uh, shared reality um, equals society. Maybe I mean it's just to say that you know we we're trying to um, uh, trying to yeah. create something together. Because uh, there's there's an argument for, um, and I can't remember who, where I read this, uh, but the argument for the, the 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 sort of brash, brave people who go out and carefree go and do something and don't think of the consequences and the people who are the warriors who think about everything too much so, and the crazy dreamers and the the really boring detail people society needs every single one of those because in a tribe the one who sat there and worried and fretted and said oh we're going to run out of food by winter was the one who made sure that they hoarded enough and they prepared enough and they farmed enough and everything like that and the brave people who went out and went oh, we don't care about that. We're okay. They're the ones who went out and discovered that they could eat something different and that they could do things. And so all of those different kind of weird, quirky character traits that, that we sometimes find in the complexifier people um, <laughs> uh, are, are actually necessary ingredients for a successful society because any one of those, the, psych the, 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 the uh, sociopath type idea, you need someone like that because if someone comes to attack you, they're the ones who lead the charge to fight them. Um, and it's no good everybody being, everyone else being nice and, and pleasant to each other if you're going to be attacked by somebody else. So society needs all of those different realities uh, mm. or people with those different perceptions of reality to them to actually function. It's, this it's, is, it's an idea. Yeah. You know? No, no, I think it's a good idea. I put quirky outlier savior um, because everyone has their their moment. And I was thinking about this just in a different context, which is that um, as we're starting to open up um, our, our city and have some businesses open up again and people allowed to go out more, um, you know, you notice who doesn't wear a mask because most people do. And there are some people that don't. Um, and I think the national average is 43% here, which seems very low considering what's happening. But there you go. In my city, I think it's probably much higher, um, but and it sticks out. So when there are people that don't wear masks, um, you can't help but sort of wonder what's the point because it what, what's what's the message? Because in this kind of kind of situation, in this configuration, the fact that the pandemic has only really been here for a few months, not wearing a mask is like sending a message of some kind to people, and. I don't know what the intended message is, but the way that I receive the message is, I don't have to care about society or any of you or the tribe because I'm different, I'm special, I don't need to care. And that makes everybody else a bit pissed off because it's saying we don't have a shared reality. Um, you know, I'm, I have to be treated differently. And, and, and I'm saying this not because, you know, it's not like I'm not recognizing that there aren't lot PPE issues. People can just wear a face covering. You know, it's not that hard to get a handkerchief or something. But the point is, is that there are people that go about not doing this on purpose. And um, I'm sort of wondering, what are we supposed to interpret that as, if not sort of saying, yeah, I mean, you could say that they are being the quirky outlier and saying, well, I just do do things differently. You know, you just have to accept for that. But there are times, I think, when we say these are extraordinary times and we need a kind of a commitment to the shared reality. We need a commitment to our community, to our society. And, you know, you're either committed to it or, or you're a problem is sort of what I think what happens in these extreme circumstances. But that's, that's how it occurs to me. I don't know how you think about it there. Well, I, I, I'm going to be a complexifier here. 
Um, <laughs> Go for it. I think there, there's in this because um, my understanding is that men uh, are less likely to wear them, particularly men of a, of a particular type of class, because it's seen as a kind of an embarrassment, a weakness, um, and and potential. Apparently, that's a bit of a thing that that if I go up the road. Um, there's a there's a there's a place just up the road that I have to go to occasionally to just you know to get the occasional bit of shopping, um, and you'll quite often see uh, the men aren't wearing them. Um, That's my fashion folk. They... <laughs> well, yeah, I mean it, it, it's as much to do with um, uh, a sort of fear of looking weak in yeah. the same way as men don't like to talk about feelings or, or don't like to sort of admit that they've got a mental health issue or something like that. Um, the the or you know, the, the idea of a boys don't cry type thing. It's the, the toxic masculinity argument. <laughs> sort of... yeah, yeah. Yes, basically. Um, uh, there's a, I think there's an element of that. And I think there's a, also, uh, again, coming back to that, we need all those kind of people. I, I you know, I'm, I'm not going to pretend that I know a lot about this disease. I'm not a virologist. I have no idea. Or an epidemiologist. I didn't even know what an epidemiologist was until a couple of months ago. Um, <laughs> So, you know, I've expanded my vocabulary. I'm not a vocabularist either. Uh, but they, um, <laughs> there's, um, uh, I've forgotten where I was going now. Um, the... <laughs> well, I was trying to point you towards the toxic masculinity. Now, you're talking about how, you know, they, 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 oh. there's all these things that you're learning for the first time. And, and people maybe, yeah. maybe are saying that they're, they're, yeah, go ahead. Well, there's those different people, the, 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 the sociopaths, the, the reckless ones who, will go out and we might find i'm just you know putting this out there we might find that this is could just be a new reality for us i'm not saying it's going to be but this could just be a new reality for us that there is another disease out there like aids whatever it was you know that means that you have to change your life and or in a particular way to compensate for that there is now a risk and you can minimize that risk in certain ways to you know, various other diseases that, that have happened over the centuries um, have affected people in different ways and and, and we've dealt with them um, and it could just be the fact where we kind of go, well, yeah, some people are going to die of this. Um, and if all of those people go out and they come back and they kind of get a bad reaction for a few months and then they survive, there could be, there is an argument to say, well, okay, well, that's it then. You know, maybe they are the, I'm not saying I agree with it, but to, to look at the idea and think, well, maybe those people going out and do that are, in a way, our kind of explorers, those recklessly dangerous people, um, are like our Columbuses or our or our or our or our mm. you know uh, uh, Marie Curies who experimented on themselves. You know, they're 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 the people kind of willing to take a risk to prove the point, um, or the people who went out, yeah, you know, wandered outside the tribal land to go and find a new hunting ground. You know, they mm. they 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 could actually end up proving something to us that we weren't expecting. Now, I, right. I, it's a it's a well, no, I it's think a it's a risk situation. Well, it's good. I'm going to, I'm actually going to suggest a first sort of, um, uh, what if issue here, which is something like what if taking risks to prove a point is good for us? Um, because, mm -hmm. because I'm looking at the mass situation and I don't like what I see, but you're saying, well, well, maybe they're, maybe they're going to be pioneers in some way that actually, you know, there's a silver lining here, a positive outcome. I hadn't thought of that. I mean, what I did think about is perhaps the other possibility that from that person's point of view, they may say, look, if you're if you're arguing about this, my behavior as a sort of a risk mitigation factor that you don't like, I can tell you that I mitigate risk in other ways. Like I don't go out very often. Maybe I go to the shops like once a week instead of four times a week. And therefore, even though I'm not wearing a mask, I'm doing a lot of risk mitigation in, my, in other aspects of my life. And this is the one area I don't want to. And I suppose that is a, an argument that someone could make. <laughs> I'm just saying that, you know, how it appears, you know, appearances, you know, do they matter or not? Is there, you know, uh, uh, what if, um, so, so maybe another what if is, it's about solidarity, you know, uh, let's mm. say, what mm. if um, following uh, the herd is important for solidarity, let's say. So that's kind of another, whoops, my handwriting is absolutely abysmal. But that's the idea that you know you're you're doing something that you don't want to do. You don't like the idea, but you are doing it because you know that a show of solidarity is important in the times. But also, a person can be discriminated against, right? If they're not showing solidarity. So, 
uh, let's see, what if uh, you endanger yourself uh, by not following the tribe? So that's about, you know, sticking out. Because uh, you want to... You would have you know, got... I mean, you would have been rejected from the tribe if you did certain things, you know, so hmm. you would have been sent outside and, and, and back in the, you know, the dark ages type thing, you know, that would have meant being eaten by wolves. That would basically mean death. So being excluded hmm. from that would have meant the wrong thing. Um, we are much more tolerant of those things and we're much more capable of dealing with them now. Um, but there was a time when, you know, saying anything against the tribe was, would get you, almost guaranteed certain death because you've been moved away from the fire, you've been moved away from the protection, mm. from that collective group. Um, now, obviously our tribe is a bit bigger. And in fact, we have thousands of micro tribes, um, which kind of sounds like a game, but um, <laughs> micro tribe. Uh, but we do, you know, we, ha we are thousands and thousands of different tribes and, you're, and we're all part of multiple ones. So people shift around, you know, you can be part of the the, the quantity surveyors tribe and also part of the golf playing tribe or the cyclist tribe. <laughs> I like that. Thousands and, and so of be... micro tribes. <laughs> 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 well, I was going to, I was also going to say that, you know, society is a bit safer now than it used to be from what you're saying. Right. So the consequences, I, I sometimes I like to, you know, say to people, well, you know, maybe stupid has consequences. Like there should, you know, maybe there are consequences to being stupid when you are living a subsistence life like you were talking about in the past. Well, yeah, the consequences of stupid is death, most likely. Nowadays, it's not death. You could be you know, as stupid as you want and probably get a lot of um, free passes because we've created a society that, that allows a lot of stupidity without, without major consequences. Um, oh, that's, our, that's the timer. Um, oh, that was my one. Oh, that was your one. Okay. Well, we've, we've, we've gone for half an hour. We actually got some good ones coming out of this, I think. Um, but... Uh, uh, so I think the, you know, the stupidest consequences, maybe, maybe, maybe like what you're suggesting here, taking risks, maybe nowadays, because stupid has less consequence that taking a risk is good for us in the yeah. sense that there are, you know, people who are not following the norm. And so I'm going to say like, maybe we should welcome some dissent is, is, uh, sort of a, you know, I haven't made it into a what if question, but some idea that we should well, welcome well, some dissent. Isn't there the, the uh, and I, I've got to make sure I get this right now, the four pillars of democracy. Um, was it four or three? I'm going to get, I'm, I'm going to get this wrong now, aren't I? I'll On tape. Uh, <laughs> uh, but there's uh, obviously the, the, the free and fair elections to elect your lawmakers, the rule of law applied to all, and um, the freedom of dissent, the right to speak out. Hmm. So it's three, Sorry, the three pillars of democracy. Um, and I'm recorded making that mistake, which is great. Uh, no, no, I'm actually, I mean, no, listen, you're, you're not alone. I'm looking here that there are some people saying there are five pillars of democracy. Oh, here we go. They got legislature, executive, judiciary. I mean, this just, I know this sounds like it goes on and on here. I don't know if that's very helpful. So, so I like you. Or there, you uh, think, oh, here we go. Freedom of religion, freedom of press, freedom of speech, freedom of petition, freedom of assembly. God, this, that's six. God, that goes on and on. So maybe yours is better. It's a nice and well, tidy. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, I, think, I think MIT drew those ones up, I think. Uh, I can't remember now. But anyway, the, but from a very, very simplistic view of it, before you start getting all clever about judiciaries and things like that, you say <laughs> basically you elect people, they make the laws, the laws apply to everybody, and you've got the right to, to, to say, I disagree with that. So you can change people's minds to elect new people who make the laws that apply to everybody, as long as you can keep speaking out. And as long as you've got those three, you have the fundamentals of democracy. You take anyone away, and like a tripod, because there's only three of them, the whole thing falls over. Hmm. So you, so that, that's my understanding, is that as long as you have those basic three, you're okay. Um, hmm. But that right of dissent, is doesn't mean it's a good thing but good things can come of it but we have as you said before risk taking um you know extreme sports stuff like that no. yeah, I, I understand a study was done in scotland and this is this was done over 10 years ago so so the data may have changed but you know people say sponsor me to jump out of a plane hmm. to do the parachute jump <laughs> okay parachute? yes 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 they, 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 this this study was done in Scotland, I think it was in the 1990s, and they did the calculations and they went, right, okay, it raised X, 
but the number of injuries cost why to the NHS. And actually, the amount that it cost to fix people after they'd sprained their ankles or broken things from jumping out of a plane outweighed the amount of money they'd raised for charity. So it's like, kind of, can we just not do that? Yeah, kind of. um, <laughs> but because we have that protection, because society, our modern society with its with its thousands of micro tribes, but it's it's evolved uh, nature has those levels of protection built into it that we can take risks and be protected still we're no it's no longer a case if you make one mistake and you're out of the tribe you can make quite a few you know you can smoke and still be looked after you can trash your car drive without a seat belt there's no don't they have that thing in the us i'm, I'm not sure it might be a statewide thing but in the uk you have to wear a seat belt that's it bang mm -hmm. yeah. um that's and, true. same here uh, sorry same here sorry say that again. it's the oh, same here i yeah. thought that Oh, I didn't think they had that. I thought that there was a difference in the airbags, that our airbags are designed to protect you. You're wearing a belt, but they're designed to protect you, whereas the US airbags are much more powerful because they're designed to protect people who've decided that it's their civil right and their freedom not to wear a seatbelt. No, I, 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 that might be outdated information. <laughs> well, well, I mean, what, what I think is very interesting is, um, I mean, is that you're right. I think we have made a society that allows for, like I say, you know, to take more, more, make make more stupid decisions but also means that we do take risks in a different way that's why i put sort of the the value of risk taking because i was thinking about what, what came to mind strangely when you were talking about this was how we're going to start to with crispr you know change our own genetics and so that's a kind of a wild adventure and i'm sure there'll be all yeah. sorts of terrible outcomes or unintended consequences of that but we're going to do it because we probably have a society where we can start to kind of manage some of these things, take those risks. Whereas if we were on sort of a scarcity subsistence living, that would be a terrible idea. Um, so we can run experiments. <laughs> and you get down to the sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs thing as well there, don't you? Where, mm. where we don't need to, as long as we've got those bottom ones, some of the stuff that we're doing now is really about um, uh, the, the the upper echelons of the, yeah, the, the top of the pyramid, uh, yes. which is the, the self-actualization side of things um I, there's that an expression are... that, that i like where it says you know that's a really that's a one percenter problem you know um <laughs> and someone that reminds you you know sort of does a reality check and says yeah that's a real one percenter problem that you have there <laughs> um because because yes i guess you know life in in many countries is better than it used to be even if it feels like it's all terrible right now all right i'm and gonna I'm experience Go. reality yep our only experience of reality experience. Yeah. yeah our experience or rea yeah our reality is shaped by our experiences so if we don't see what it's like to live in another country with different different priorities different problems then we assume everybody lives the way that we do well that's a nice segue into the next jam but this is also an explanation of why i like to do this with people from all over the world because of that very phenomenon you you see things differently i see things differently we get by getting together and talking about it, we, we kind of see some new things, hopefully, or, or come to understanding some stuff that we had forgotten or took for granted and whatnot. So thank you for that. That's, um, that's jam number one. I've got a few, uh, a few, you know, sort of issues, which I'm going to, to wrap up and, and include on the site. So I'm going to quickly move us into the next jam if we have time.